there we are. How's everybody doing tonight? Or if you're watching later in the week, how's it going? Good to have you here for Ask the Pastor. Starring Jesus. I have no intention of anybody else playing a starring role in this broadcast than the Son of God himself. Now, I am hosting, and I'm trying to do my best to fulfill my mission that the Son of God has placed upon my life, And uh, but he will have the starring role tonight. You got a problem with that? Then you probably won't like this broadcast. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for this crazy opportunity I get every week, Lord God, to communicate how wonderful your word is and to answer questions and to, Lord, uh, um, uh, just be, well, Lord, it seems as though you do a lot of miracles, Lord, when your people are just obedient and they show up. And Lord, we're believing for that tonight, God, have your way. Through the questions, through everything, God, just, just be lifted up. And I pray that anybody who tunes in, even if it's just for five seconds, tuning it out, tuning it in, Lord, that it would not be a waste of time for anybody, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your live comments take precedence over any questions that we have prepared here tonight. So if you're watching live, join in on the fun. Because the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is fun. And I've elaborated on that scripture so often. You may be tired of me hearing it, but you know, if you're hearing that for the first time and you go, what do you mean by that? Well, yeah, it actually says it. It actually says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is fun. The translators don't want to admit it, but it doesn't take away from the fact that that's what it says. Are you ready to go? I got a ton of questions that my buddy Kirk has provided for us. And of course, if any fresh ones come in on the comment section, we will go to them immediately. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 4. I must go on boasting. Okay, this is Paul talking about. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I am no a man in Christ who for 14 years, who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or part of the body, I do not know, but God knows. Was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. And Kirk asked, why did Paul find it necessary to boast about a vision in which he went to the third heaven? A vision he said that he was not permitted to speak about. I have no clue, Kirk. It's a great question. What I get from that verse, you know, and not just to evade your question, because I honestly can't answer it the way you want me to, but I will comment on it. What I get from that verse is that Paul was humbled by it. Uh, probably felt unworthy even knowing about it and getting inside information. And uh, because this is the same chapter, the theme of this chapter, this is the same chapter where he, he boasts about his weaknesses, you know that uh, God's grace is sufficient for him, and I think he was truly humbled by the greatness of God. And uh, he's sharing about it. He's boasting in the Lord. That's what boasting in the Lord is. And God's great, man. I got to witness this firsthand. At least that's what I'm getting out of it. I'm certainly open to anybody else's take on it if they want to go in the comments section and, you know, elaborate. We can go a little bit further. And then 2 Corinthians 12, 9, pretty much one of my life's verses. Here we read the Lord responded to Paul's request. Paul said the Lord spoke to him. Do we know in what way he spoke? Was it audible? Again, no clue. No clue, okay? Um, I use the phrase, and a lot of people that follow Jesus say, well, God spoke to me. I have never heard an audible voice from God. Okay, now I've talked to people who swear they have, and they felt they were directed by God. Um, I personally have never heard an audible voice from God, but I've compared notes with a lot of followers of Christ. And those of us that use the terminology, God spoke to me, I can speak for myself and for most of them. 
even if God did use an audible voice in those times where I know he's spoken to me, it wouldn't have been any more real. It wouldn't have been any more stark that God wanted me to do what he wanted me to do. How do I know? In the gut, right there, in the gut. Well, critics might say that's just indigestion or maybe you had too much cheese on your pizza, okay? And I remind them the terminology the Bible uses is when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, you accept him into your heart, okay? And it uses terminology like you will find God when you seek him with all your heart. And for decades, in the early part of the 20th century, you know, we were led to believe, well, the brain is everything. You know, it's the center of emotion, it's the center of thought. And it's only in the last 20, 30 years, as more research has done, that, uh, you know, the, the really honest scientists are saying, no, it's not just the brain. The heart has a lot to do with, you know, emotions. It has a lot to do with, and then the brain and the heart are connected. You can't separate the two, okay? And when a, a, a follower of Christ gets a gut feeling, well, it makes sense that, you know, if, 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 you know, the center of our will, the center of our emotions, the center of who we really are is the heart. Now, we do have the intellect. We're not divorcing the brain from the heart. But if that's where it is, that's probably where God's going to speak. That's probably where he's going to confirm these leadings or, this, or, or us sensing the leading of his Holy Spirit. Hey, I seek God with all my heart, soul, and mind. It makes sense that one of the primary areas, maybe the primary where he's going to speak to me, is in the same place where I've been seeking him with everything in my heart. Makes sense to me. Again, anybody wants to elaborate on stuff, go to the comments section. And we'll get her going back and forth a little bit if you want. Of course, you can't do that if you're watching, you know, on Thursday or Friday. It's only for, the, it's only for those wonderful people that are tuning in live. Besides his written word, how does God speak to us today? And I guess I've just already answered that question in our gut, okay? Um, uh, primarily, in, in my case, I'm being very uh, subjective here, but, uh, you know, uh, we followers of Christ, we compare notes, and uh, I think God speaks through circumstances. I think he uh, uh, speaks through opportunities or the lack of opportunities. In other words, he directs. Um, I think he can speak through other people. I think there is an infinite number of ways that he can speak. I've often, you know, been watching a, a video or a, a television show, and not necessarily from a what you would call a Christian or a godly source, and I feel God speaking to me powerfully. I've had some powerful, powerful, life-changing moments where God is speaking. I think the main thing is, if, if you want God to direct, direct and speak you, you've you got to be open to it. you got to be looking for it. And if you're not sure, I think it's very fair to say to God, okay, God, if this is you, I need more confirmation. I need more confirmation. Now, you could that you could take that to extreme, okay, where God keeps telling you over and over and over and over, but because you really, you really want to do what you want to do instead of what he wants to do. So you keep making, you know, excuses. And I think we're weak enough that if we sincerely ask God to expose our weaknesses, and you know what, you shouldn't be afraid of asking God to expose your weaknesses because he doesn't humiliate and embarrass. He will expose your weaknesses for the sake of ministry and making them stronger and taking away your fear, okay? You can trust God. You can, you can trust God to the point where you become more vulnerable to him than anybody that you've ever been in a relationship with, okay? And he will not abuse. He will not take advantage. It was the devil that created the kick them when they're down tactic. That's not Jesus. He protects us from ourselves. Okay. We can do more damage to ourselves than anybody can. And he can protect us from ourselves. In fact, I would suggest he's the only one that can protect us from ourselves. And I mean, uh, not counting, you know, loved ones that he moves upon that will help protect you as well. Okay. So that's how he speaks. There's, there's an infinite way, primarily through his word, okay? In fact, that's probably the best test of all the other ways he speaks. Well, is this God? Or if I start asking for confirmation, uh, often sometimes God will give you a scripture to lead you and say, no, that's not the way you're going. Or, yeah, yeah, it could be. Keep digging. Keep seeking, you know? 
It's always fair to talk to God and say, okay, I'm not getting this. Show me. Open my eyes here. What am I missing? Man, I'm praying like that all the time. All the time. He answers those prayers. Test it. That's the word. Test it. Words. Please explain how power is perfected in weakness. Well, less of self, more of Jesus. John the Baptist was the one that coined the term, I must decrease so that he can increase. Uh, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. You know, if you're not hungry, you know, if you're satisfied, if you're big and strong, well, 1 Corinthians says that he chooses the weak to shame the strong. He chooses the foolish to shame the wise. And it's a wonderful thing, thing to, be, to, 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 to realize how weak you are in self and, and, and because that unlocks the opportunity for God to start doing things. In our weakness, he is made, he is made strong, okay? Uh, John 15, 5, Jesus tells us, apart from, he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing, okay? And there has to be some time that acknowledgement that I cannot do this without Jesus. You can't save yourself without Jesus, you can't conquer sin without Jesus. You can't <coughs> reach your greatest potential without Jesus. I mean, when he says, apart from me, you can do nothing, that's a, that's a grand sweeping statement. And it's the word of God, and it's true. And he can't, he can't be Lord of your life if you are Lord of your life. Okay. If you accept him as Lord and Savior, you are, you know, we become living sacrifices. The problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. Okay, well, we stay on the altar. We, we, we keep him on the throne, so to speak. And we are often trying to assume rulership of our life, and that's when we lose. If you follow Christ, it doesn't work like that. You are not in charge anymore if you follow Christ. You surrender rulership to him, okay? And if you're really doing that, you're going to see his power work in your life, okay? In fact, that can be a good test as to whether, you know, uh, um, he's really ruling in your life, okay? How much are you surrendered to him? Most stresses and most problems that people have following Jesus can be solved by surrendering to him. There's some area of your life you're not surrendered to him, or there's some area of your life that you're still holding on to. You won't let go. You won't trust him enough to say, okay, God, have your way. Okay? And that could be hard, but that's the kind of stuff you pray about. God, help me surrender. God, help me trust you. God, help me truly follow you as Lord of my life. Next question. Why do we sometimes hear people say the Bible is boring? Not only is it instructional, but it's mysterious and humorous. Well, yeah, I agree. There are parts of it that are mysterious and humorous and instructional. But, and, and I reserve the right to be wrong. I'm going to give you my opinion, though, because I, I have to be honest. There, Leviticus is the boringest book of the Bible. Numbers is, is a close second. Okay. And people love Song of Solomon because it's so romantic. I find Song of Solomon as boring as, 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 you know, toast with no butter and jam on it. Okay? There are some sections that are just boring. Now, I'm a very strong advocate of reading the entire Bible cover to cover. Okay? And uh, I'm on my, I think, my 16th time right now reading it through. And because uh, I need every part of it. I need the parts that I think are boring. It's still the word of God, even though I think it's boring. Who made me the grand arbitrator of what is good and what isn't good? Nobody. He's the grand arbitrator. Okay. I'm just a mere human expre expressing an opinion and reserving the right to be wrong. Um, but I have talked to a lot of Christians, especially new Christians, that sometimes find the word boring. And um, I, I, I encourage them, well, ask God to help you understand it. Or come up with a system, and I've, I've always provided systems of how to read the Bible so it isn't as boring. And there's ways to do that. 
The worst way to read the Bible is start at Genesis and start at the beginning, go right to the end. You know, forget that. Come on. You do that if you're going to read a novel or, or you know, like, it, it, this is the book of life. This is this book reads you. You don't just read it, okay? So there's the, the, you can develop a skill to reading the Bible. You can get better at it. And the more it reads you and the less you no, the more you it reads you as you're reading it, um the more you're going to discover, whoa, this is really the word of God. Okay? And it will become less boring. I I, I mean it, when you don't know the author, you know, it uh, becomes boring. I've, I've read a few books. Uh, I've got a few books in my library of people that I've met, and I know them, and you know, some of them are even friends. And uh, boy, you, you, you're so much more into a book if you know the author. And I would suggest the greatest cure to making the Bible less boring is to really, really, really know the author. Get to know the author. Well, how do you do that? Well, you first start talking to him and ask him, God, I need to know you. Show me how to know you. Watch Ask the Pastor, too, because they talk about a lot of this stuff, you know. 2 Corinthians 12, 16. Explain how Paul caught them by trickery. He uses that line. Well, I, I think they thought, and I don't have the reference, but you know what? Maybe I, I didn't print it out, but I'll look it up here just quickly so that uh, we get the actual wording that he used. He says, I caught you by trickery. Now, why would a man of God talk like that? What in the world is he getting at, okay? 2 Corinthians 12, 16, the actual wording. Be that as may, I have not been a burden to you. Yet, crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. Did I exploit you through any of the men I sent you? I urged Titus to go to you and sent our brother with him. Titus did not exploit you, did he? He did not walk in the same footsteps by the same, did he not walk in the same footsteps with the same spirit? Okay, I caught you by trickery. They thought that Paul was some great big, big shot authoritarian prophet that was unapproachable. Okay? And he did not come to them dictating what was what. You got to do this, you got to do that, okay? And that God doesn't like that, and God likes that. He didn't rule by decree when he came in there. He served them. He loved them. He won them over with humility and love. He was not a burden to them financially. He made sure that he took care of all his financial needs when he was there. He caught them by trickery. He tricked them. He won their favor. Because he was not what they expected him to be. Ah, I'm a crafty guy. I tricked you guys. You thought that serving God was some type of hierarchical, oh, look at this guy coming in. Like, he's got it together better than anybody. No, he was transparent. And he, they probably, you know, he boasted about his weaknesses, too. They saw his flaws as well. And they realized, whoa, you know, this guy is, uh, this guy is the same battles that we battle. And he was approachable. He became a wonderful role model for them, and that's that's why he endeared themselves to them. It's too bad there isn't more leaders who, you know, say they're leaders of Christ. I mean, I, I see these guys on video. They go around calling themselves apostle. They go around calling themselves prophet and all this other junk. You know what? If you're a real apostle, a real prophet, you wouldn't be boasting about it. Your number one quality would be humility, okay? And, 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 People that claim those offices for themselves so often are lacking in that. I turn them off like I, you know, clicking off the TV station. You know, to me, they have no credibility whatsoever. But that's, you know, that's my opinion. How do we test and examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith? Um, that's a great question um, because if you don't do that, you can get arrogant. You can get blind to your own sin. I think the Pharisees, you know, they, they were terrible for that. They never, you know, questioned whether they were in the faith. They, they just thought they were so together that I don't, it doesn't look like there was much accountability amongst each other. Um, how do you test and examine yourself to see if you're in the faith? Well, I confess a lot. When I screw up, I'm usually telling somebody and uh, asking people to pray for me and help me. Um, I listen to feedback from people that I love. I'm doing it all the time. 
Um, I express my opinion a lot, my thoughts, because that lets me know, okay, am I on track or not? Or is that something I need to like maybe back off on? Okay. And uh, how do you... How do you examine yourselves? It's, it's hard to do if you're not in a church family either as well, because God sets us in families, you know, to uh, uh, to build us up and strengthen us when we fall and to, you know, to pull us uh, back, you know, when we get too arrogant, and too full of ourselves and uh, um, to kind of show us that we are in the faith, you know, um, and it's a lot easier to minister to the lost when you're doing it together with other brothers and sisters, because, you know, we're stronger together than we are on our own. There's more giftings that are represented. We could be more for uh, the people that we're called to minister to when we've got a group, you know, that works together instead of just <clears throat> somebody trying to slug it out on their own. Tell us about the holy kiss we read about in Scripture. <clears throat> Okay, that kiss, uh, it's an embrace. It has no connotation of physical attraction whatsoever, okay? Uh, it is an honorable thing, and it is a, 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 a genuine, honorable respect and affection for the body of Christ, okay? It's what families do. Now, in Western culture, particularly British and German cultures, uh, which most of North America was settled by uh, English and German people, uh, the, the, we're not like Mediterraneans, okay? Greeks, Italians, Spaniards, and, and people in Northern Africa and the Middle East, I mean, they're a whole big thing. If you're part of their family, even people that are they're always, you know, the, you know, the double kiss on each side, that's part of their culture. So they got that right away, okay? That's And that's where it comes from. I mean, that's not, that's not where, okay, it's part of that culture, but you don't have to explain that scripture to people that have been raised in those cultures. They get it right away. They know there's nothing physical or, or sexual there. It's an honorable, respectable, affectionate way of saying you're part of us. We're together. We're connected. Okay? If we're going to have a cold, we're going to share that cold. We're going to you know, share everything. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, dear. Husbands and wives, you know, when husband and wives get a cold, when one gets a cold, they usually both get the cold. It goes through the whole family, you know? 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul ends 2 Corinthians by mentioning grace, love, and fellowship. Tell us more about this trio and why Paul used them here. Uh, they're Well, they're all foundational, okay? There's three things there, okay? Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ... May that be with you. He wants them to understand the amazing grace of God, which is disarming, which is difficult to grasp. If you can really grasp the depths and the power of God's grace, it, it, it just leaves you spellbound. I'm still trying to get a handle on it. And he wants them blown away by that, because if you ever really understand um, the, the grace of uh, Jesus, it, it will immobilize you in a good way to the point where, you know, you, you can't save yourself. And anything good or anything that happens in, in our lives comes from Jesus. Okay? That's so may the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. I mean, the, the part I'm thinking about when he talks to church in his vision, I want you to grasp the depth and the breadth and the, and the height of the love of God. And it's worth the pursuit. It's not just some hippy dippy trip where you're staring off at me. Oh man, God's love, man. It's just like, it's, it's it's really wild, man. No, no, no. It's very grounded in reality. It's powerful, and it will end up being the most wonderful motivation to do good and do right, if you can grasp. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's a that's a very interesting one because uh, all these people come together in the body of Christ and and the old line is you can choose your friends but you can't choose your family well you can't choose the family of, that God puts together okay in the body of Christ that family now what causes us to love one another and want to greet one another with a holy holy kiss what causes and I've used this line before too you know uh, blood is thicker than water but Christ's blood is even thicker than family blood the ties that take place within the body of Christ is uh, are, are just, they're deeper, they're richer, they're more powerful, okay? So when he says, you know, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with you all, 
The Holy Spirit is the one that empowers that connection. He empowers that love. And Paul wants that to be a reality. And I think when he tells the church in Corinth, I think he's telling them, look, let God have his way here. Don't make church into your what you think it ought to be. If the Lord is the center, if he's having his way, it's his church, and he brings the whole thing alive as we yield to his priorities and his principles in the church. Okay? And they're, they're all foundational. Oh, got one on the comment section. Oh, it's my buddy Bruce. How you doing, Bruce? I haven't seen you at church in forever, man. What's the problem, man? Bruce, you ought to know by now that church isn't as good without you, you know? So I expect to see you there Sunday or, you know, Thursday at the soup night or Wednesday, tomorrow night at the Bible study. Uh, do you think we will ever have earthquakes in Ottawa like in Turkey? Well, I remember sitting in the, in, in I remember being in the auditorium in uh, Bethel Pentecostal Church on the corner of Fisher and Viewmount. I was on staff there for eight years. And I was looking for something in the sound room, the, the, you know, the, 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 the technical area, and it's in the center of the balcony there, when all of a sudden an earthquake hit Ottawa. I mean, I'll tell you, if you want to have an earthquake, that's the place to be. In an auditorium in a great big room that seats 1,200, and the whole building is shaking, and because it's big, you can hear the resonance of it freaked me right out. So what did I do? I immediately got out of the building. And, of course, everybody in the building had felt it. I don't think anybody in the building felt it like I did because I was in that big room when it hit. And I was the only one in the room. It was dark, okay, with just a little light on. And I walked out, and, and of course, and that, that happened. Oh, that would have been about 10 years ago. So we, Ottawa has earthquakes. Now, that was a weak one, okay? And... Uh, um, do you think he says? Do you think we'll have earthquakes in Ottawa, like in Turkey, uh, Syria? Death toll now forty-one thousand. Well, yeah, we could have one in Turkey, but um, the difference in Canada, and I don't mean to you know, say we're any better, but the difference in Canada is our infrastructure here, and is much more capable of handling a devastating earthquake than the infrastructure in Turkey is. That is a at the at best a second world country, and there are parts of Turkey still that you would call a third world country. Okay, and when devastation, when a natural disaster hits, they're not as capable. They don't have an infrastructure to, to, to battle it like we do. And I would suggest, and I'm no expert on earthquakes, but there's 41,000. The death toll is probably there. If that same earthquake hit Ottawa, you'd probably have maybe three or four thousand. Okay, because of the infrastructure we have to battle that type of thing. Okay like fire and emergency services and quick recovery and machinery to move uh, buildings around, okay? Now, I'm not minimizing in any way. Um, now, uh, uh, Bruce quotes Nahum thir uh, 1, uh, verse 3. Uh, the Lord, oh, I've got to keep down, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are dust. Of his, are the dust of his feet. Who can, under, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. I don't think, and then Bruce says, I don't think God was angry with him, but he knew it was going to happen. It's just so sad. Well, that's true, although you can, you know, whether this has any bearing on it, um, you know, the, the Bible says that Jesus said the last days there would be earthquakes in diverse pl places. Are we living in the last days? I could be wrong, but I think we are. Okay. Ivana. And Ivana's using her married name. Ivana Herrera. Oh, that's so nice. I did their wedding about a month ago. That's nice to see you, man. That's the first time I've ever seen your, you use your married name on, on, a, on a, a comment like that. So God bless you for that. Hi, if a brother or sister in Christ dress, uh, dresses, behaves inappropriately, how do you go about it? Well, every situation is different. The church is not rules and regulations. The church is love and respect for one another. So if you really love and respect one another, we, we help each other be Christ-like. You know, we don't condemn people. Um, if I had to step in and advise somebody, you know, if they're, first of all, if they're a follower of Christ, that makes all the difference in the world. I have an open door to encourage. I have an open door to correct. I have an open door to lovingly come aside and say, hey, you know, we'll we'll help you with this if there's issues, okay? If they're not a professing Christian and they don't know the Lord, I got no say whatsoever. It's none of my business, okay? 
you know, and, and one of the lines we use in Christchurch is, let sinners be sinners. I don't expect sinners to live like Christians, okay? I am thrilled when Christians live like Christians. Yeah, it actually happens sometimes. There's actually Christians that act like followers of Christ. And when that happens, it's wonderful, okay? And uh, the Bible's pretty clear on that, you know, like we're to hold to one another to account, not to fall into legalism and nonsense, but just to help each other, you know, and just to like, uh, uh, well, we're there for one another. We protect one another. And sometimes you got to protect somebody from themselves. They can't see it. And if they, if they know that you love them, the proverb says, let the righteous smite me. It will be a pleasing oil. In other words, it's going to be good for me. It's going to, it's going to make me better. And I've had the luxury of having good, close brothers and sisters for decades because I get in trouble a lot. I stick my foot in my mouth a lot. And, and I've got a lot of wonderful brothers and sisters that are not intimidated by me. And uh, they nail me. And I've needed it. I've needed it. That's how you handle it. There's no set way of doing it. The number one thing is love. Okay? I guess what we get out of this conversation is the number one thing is love. If somebody doesn't profess Christ and they're not, they haven't invited Christ into their life, I got no expectations on them at all. Okay, none. Okay, and uh, but if they profess Christ, that's different. I have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to each other to protect each other. Okay. Great question, Bobby. <clears throat> John twenty one and three. Did Peter give up on Christ and decide to return to his previous profession? Or did he choose just to go fishing to kill time? Um, uh, you're going to like this answer, Kirk. Um, I think with Peter, there was a little bit of ADHD there. I think he was bored. I think he couldn't sit still. He didn't know what else to do. And he didn't want to be accused of just laying around the pool doing nothing. So he said, I'm, I'm going back fishing. I don't think he turned away from Jesus at all. He didn't know what else to do. And that's what he knew what to do. So that's what he did. And uh, I think Jesus honored him because, you know, Jesus didn't depart. You know, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And as far as I'm concerned, um, I think that's an honorable thing. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I'm noticing myself on the screen here. Um, I just took another throat lozenge. I'm having a few uh, throat problems tonight. So if you see that happen, it's because I want I want you to hear me, okay? I'm doing my best. Were there any Old Testament prophets that lost their salvation? Well, that's God's call, isn't it? Um, I was reading, oh, I can't remember where it was now. Maybe 2 Kings or Chronicles. It's a story about a prophet that's told to go a certain way and to leave by another way. And while he's on his journey, an older prophet comes to him and says, come to my house. And the guy says, no, I got to go this way. And then I got to go that way. He says, yeah, well, I'm a prophet too. And uh, God told me that you're supposed to come to my place. Well, he went to his place and he got distracted. And in the middle of them, you know, having fellowship together, the older prophet says, oh, you disobeyed the Lord. God's going to judge you because you disobeyed him, you know. And I, I don't I don't understand that, you know, because like, and, and, and the Bible says, I think a wild animal killed the guy. He went back on his journey and the younger prophet that had listened to the older prophet and disobeyed God on his mission, he was killed by an animal. And the older prophet grieves for him and, you know, buries him. And, and I'm thinking to myself, well, why did the younger prophet, you know, get killed here when the older, why did the older prophet lead him astray? Why didn't God kick the butt of the older prophet? That's my problem with that story. So I don't know. Um, did did one of those prophets lose their salvation there? I don't know. It's the only one I know of in the Old Testament where I scratch my head and I'm going, what is going on here? You know? Um, Balaam is a possibility too. I mean, Balaam had a gift from God that he hired himself out, you know, I guess to the highest bidder and he was asked to put a curse on Israel, but of course he knew God, he couldn't do it. But the very fact he was dealing with a guy that was an enemy of Israel, does that mean he lost his salvation? I don't know, it's God's call. Those are two stories that come to mind right now, so I do not know. If somebody else has got a record of it and knows something in the Bible where a prophet lost their salvation and you want to post it, and we'll talk about it, okay?
Great question, though, Kirk. Philippians 2.12, how are we to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Well, first of all, it says work out, don't work for. And uh, the best illustration I've ever heard is Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky, born with, you know, incredible athletic ability. But his father knew at a young age that wouldn't be enough. So his father worked him and worked him and worked him and had him practice and practice and practice and put within him a work ethic where he was always the first guy on the ice and the last guy to leave. He was working out. He had enough ability they could have probably made the NHL without that, but he became the greatest because he worked out. Now, salvation has come into our life. We cannot earn our salvation. It is We are saved by grace. But most of us um, are going to be on the planet for a little while, okay? I could be on this planet for another 30, 35 years. I could be gone in two or three years. God, and rightly so, expects me because the most incredible experience that anybody can experience on this planet has come into my life. I think it's right for God to expect. You know what? I want to see some productivity in your life. You know, I, I shed my blood for you and I died for you. I, I think it's okay. I think it's right for Jesus who I know how much he's loved me. I think it's right for him to make demands on me. Just like a loving father would. A loving father knows how great his son will be. Jesus knows the supernatural power that rests within us. And that's why he tells us how to live. Okay? And that's what working out is about. It flexing those muscles. We've got muscles we don't even know we have. So we work out. How do we work out? Well, we get in a church. We get involved. We interact. We, 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 you know, uh, make sure that we work on our prayer life. We live the Christ life with others. We forgive, you know. We don't let things slide. No, no. We make things right all the time because life is not right. Life, there's always screw up with life. You're going to need to forgive. You're going to need to learn how to handle stress. You're going to need to learn how to handle. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. So how can we be of good cheer because he's overcome the world? By letting him overcome you and yourself. He's overcome the world. It doesn't bug him, but it will bug you if he hasn't overcome you. If you are not yielded to him in some part of your life, there's going to be stress. Stress is evidence that Jesus isn't Lord somewhere in your life. Let me repeat that line. Stress and strife and worry. That is evidence that Jesus is not Lord in some area of your life. I got to keep making him Lord all the time. This John Council guy, man, he's stubborn. He, he, man, you give him an inch, he's going to take a mile. And he just does it without me knowing. And I got to keep crawling back on the altar all the time because he expects me to be a living sacrifice. Now, if I'm a martyr and I give up my life for Christ, <clears throat> that's easy. That's a one-shot deal. It's over. I go to heaven. If I'm around for another 2, 5, 10, 15, 30 years, man, every day he expects me to live for him. And I need his help. I know I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. That's scripture right there. Okay. Stay in the word. You know, work out your salvation. He'll give you scripture for it. Acts 2.42. This is de describing the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, they didn't just hear them teach. Hey, man, they put into practice. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. No, I'm not going to miss church. No, I'm not. I'm going to show up. Yeah, I'm going to be with my brothers and sisters. Yeah, I got all kinds of things I got to do. And all oh, the devil will distract you from getting together with the body. Oh, my goodness, because he knows how powerful it is. And they devoted themselves to breaking bread and to prayer. In other words, their fellowship was centered around Christ. They prayed together. That's all part of working out your salvation. None of that is working for. It's taking advantage of the supernatural that has come into your life and seeing, okay, let's see what this puppy can do. Let's see how much power we got. Let's see what we can accomplish together in Jesus. Okay? That's what working out is. Next question. As believers in Christ, what promises are we waiting to be fulfilled? Um, we're waiting for our salvation to be fulfilled. Okay? 
you're not really saved until you get to heaven. Well, yeah, you're saved. Yeah, you, you got the assurance. He comes in. But the manifestation and the security of it and the finality of it is when you stand before the Lord. Okay? Philippians 1.6 says, He who began the good work in you will finish it to completion. It's not completion until you're dead. Okay? So I'm waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. I have a home in heaven. It's been promised to me, but it won't have the fulfillment until I am actually there. Okay? And the coming of Jesus. That's a promise that is, you know, behold, I come quickly. Well, he isn't here yet. That's a promise he made. I'm waiting for that to be fulfilled. There's two. There's probably more. If anybody can think of any more, put them on the comment section. Hey, look, at I'm not the be-all, you know, grand wazoo guru of all things, you know, biblical. I'm learning like you are. So that's why, you know, you put things on the comment section. We learn together. Where in Scripture can we find proof, I want proof, that the apostles' letters were indeed Scripture themselves? Well, you're not going to find it in Scripture, okay? you got to look at other sources. I mean, the Bible is filled with admonitions that, you know, the Word of God is living and active and how miraculous it is. But it doesn't say anywhere specifically, now this really is the Word of God, you know? It claims to be. You can reject that claim if you want. You know, I, I've, I've done enough research and I've come to the conclusion that it, yeah, it is the word of God. And it's way more powerful than it even looks on the surface. There's more to it than that. And I'm discovering more and more every day how, how really supernatural the Bible is. I know it's a very anecdotal, a very subjective uh, question. But, you know, if I answered very, very objectively with all sorts of facts and everything... I may as well just be saying, you know, that I'm part of a, a religious club. But no, it's more to it than that. Christ has died. Christ has risen from the dead and conquered sin. And he is alive in my life. And he cannot be reduced to just a theological concept or an apologetic. He is alive. And there's the whole love aspect there, too. He loves me. And I feel that love. And I love him back. It's like, you know, trying to ask, what's so romantic about a beautiful poem? How do you write a beautiful poem? How the heck do I know? But I know that a poem has the ability to reach into your soul and just melt you. And the Word of God's got the ability to do that too. If you let it, if your heart's open, if you don't have a heart of stone. And if you do have a heart of stone, Jesus can help you with that too. How do we know the apostles, okay, yeah, okay. How do we know the apostles' letters were being copied and circulated among the Gentile churches? There's all kinds of extra biblical and extra and, uh, archaeological evidence for that. There's no way they could have uh, uh, reached that many people. There's no way the word of God could have had that uh, impact without copying, okay? That's a pretty easy one. There's a stark, a, a ton of uh, archaeological and extra biblical evidence for that. Give us a definition of repentance, then tell us why it is necessary. It is a necessary part of our walk with Christ. What's a good definition of, re of repentance? Well, um, the, I know the Greek word for repentance. It literally means turning and about face, 180 degree uh, um, um, change of direction. Okay, so it's a change of direction. It's not just confessing. In fact, repentance is much more the act of turning and less. That's why the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Okay that God has raised Christ from the dead, you will be saved. It does. The word repentance is not in that verse, but the concept of repentance is in the believe in your heart. There is a turning. Repentance is the result of a, of a, of a genuine, of the genuine presence of Jesus. You can tell some, Jesus has come into somebody's life by, by their change in priorities, okay? So a, a, a definition of repentance is a turning, a change of direction, okay? And, uh, it's necessary because because God will not party with sin, okay? And we ask him to come into our life. First of all, I don't think we're capable of repentance unless Jesus comes in to our life first. We have to confess him and we have to invite him in. And him coming in, that's when the change takes place. Sometimes the change is instantaneous in people's lives. Other times it takes a while, you know? 
and uh, we trust God for his empowerment. I mean, the way you worded the question there, Kirk, you say, why is it necessary part of our walk with Christ? I don't believe repentance is something that we create. I think uh, repentance is a result that Jesus has come into our life. It is a work of his grace. It is a work of his presence. We step into a life of repentance where we are no longer, you know, we are no longer ruling ourselves. He is ruling. And he's taking over more and more in our life as we grow in him. In other words, the repentance is getting deeper as we walk with him and he empowers us. Is reconciliation with God something God initiates, or is it man's attempt to be right with an indifferent God? Reconciliation has been initiated by the cross. Okay? He's made the ultimate first move by dying on the cross. While we were yet sinners, before we ever decided to get right with him, he died for us, okay? So he initiated the interaction, he, inter he, he initiated the agreement of reconciliation and made it available to us, okay? God is the furthest thing from indifferent that you could be imagined. And you worded your question, or is it man's attempt to be right with an indifferent God? He's never been indifferent. He's about the most opposite to indifferent as you can imagine, okay? And he has initiated this whole thing in the hope that our hearts would turn to him and that we would be reconciled to him. How are we reconciled to him? Sin's got to go. He will not be in fellow. He cannot have as part of his family somebody that's, that's, that is infected by sin. And the only cure is the power of his blood. But he can't force that on us, so we have to desire it. We, it's been made available. We have access to it via the blood, but we have to desire it first. We open our lives to him. And then he comes in and starts doing what he wants to do, if we'll let him. But it's wonderful if he has his way. Is there any conflict between God being just and the justifier? <clears throat> okay, now, listen to your question, Kirk, because how you've worded it. Is there any conflict, you asked, between God being just and the justifier? And I totally understand that. And I'm going to answer it with a question, and I don't mean to be smart, Alecky, but I think it's the best way to handle this. If there is a conflict, who are you going to bring your conflict to? Who are you going to bring your concern to? He's God. He makes the rules. It was his idea. He's laid it out like this. It does if I perceive there's a conflict there, who cares? There's nothing I can do about it. What's the best I can do? Okay, that's the way it is. Okay, I want to get to know this God. I want him living in my life. I want to be on the right side of him, you know? <laughs> funny to me. I don't know. Might not be coming off as funny to you guys there. Okay. Why did death come so quickly to Jesus while crucifixion could drag out for days for others under the same sentence? Well, because most people who are crucified didn't get the holy crap kicked out of them like Christ did. I mean, they whipped and they beat him. I was just reading it today in Matthew 27, 28. It says they took uh, uh, sticks and they beat him on the head repeatedly. I mean, the cause of death was probably, you know, bleeding to death, but there was probably internal hemorrhaging as well in his brain. I mean, it's a miracle that he was conscious almost till the end, okay? And uh, like his wasn't a typical crucifixion. I mean, they did crucifixions, you know, because they wanted to be a slow, painful death so that they could, you know, scare the population into realizing, hey, we're Rome, we're in charge, don't mess with us, you could be up on one of these crosses next. Christ was a little bit different, okay? There's a lot of people that had it out for him, and, and God took his protection off of him and let the devil have his way momentarily. Okay? There was nothing that happened there that was by chance or by accident. Okay? Please give us a thorough contrast. He wants a thorough contrast now. Not just, he doesn't want me to mail it in. It's just got to be, give me some meat here, pal. I don't want you spending just 30 seconds on this question. Please give us a thorough contrast between 
Calvinism and Arminianism. Well, I, uh, Kirk, I can't be too thorough because of the format of what we're doing here. It's question and answering. It's a podcast. Um, but I'm going to give you the best illustration I have ever heard that shows beautifully the contrast between Calvinism and Arminianism. On the surface, Calvinism basically is summed up with once saved, always saved. You give your life to Christ, you can't lose your salvation. Arminianism says you receive Christ, but you know, you better live right because you can lose your salvation. They are two what theologians would call extremes. Both have solid, solid um, backing in Scripture. So what's the balance? Well, I'm going to get to the balance, but I'm first going to give you a thorough contrast in the best illustration I've ever heard. Now, it's ridiculously simple, but I've never heard an illustration that better illustrates the difference and the contrast between Calvinism and Arminianism. Calvinism is like the mama cat. The mama cat picks up the kittens. Picks up the kittens by the scruff of the neck. Yeah, bites them, lifts them with her mouth, and picks up the cat by the scruff of the neck and carries them from place to place. The kittens are helpless. The kittens can do nothing. The kittens go like this. They have no say in where, where they are being transported in the first, you know, the beginning of their life. Okay? That's Calvinism. God's the mama cat. We're the little kittens. He decides everything. Okay? We have no say. We are totally secure. Okay? In mama cat. Arminianism, God is like a mother monkey. Takes the little baby monkey, throws it on its back, and then goes swinging from tree to tree. And that little monkey better hang on for life, because if that monkey lets go, that monkey's going to die. Okay? And some of them do. Wow, that doesn't sound too secure, does it? Well, Arminianism doesn't pretend to sound secure. Okay? So there's the two contrasts. Both rooted in Scripture. So where's the truth? I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. And we use the example of the kangaroo. Little baby, you know, was born and crawls into the mama's pouch. Now, mama, you know, she takes a lot of big jumps and is jumping all over the place. I mean, there's no animal that can jump like a kangaroo. And mama tells the kangaroo... You stay down in that pouch, and you stay good and secure. You'll be fine. Don't be messing around like a daredevil. Don't tempt me. Don't go to the edge. Don't think, you know, oh, this is cool, you know, like I can, I'm safe. No, no, you stay where you need to stay. You'll be fine. Okay, so you got a little bit of the free will there, but security at the same time, okay? Best illustration I've ever heard. In fact, I've read theological treaties, you know, explaining contracts. Still not as good as that illustration. On the comment section. Where is it here? I saw a scripture up there. Did Ivana take it off? Hmm. All I'm reading on the comment section, I saw a scriptural reference for a second there. Oh, there it is. It's back up there again. Self-defense in the Bible. Oh, it's from Rami. That's uh, um, Ivana's husband. Okay. Wants to know about self-defense in the Bible and uses Matthew 5, 38 to 40 as a reference of what's going on here. So let's find out about self-defense in the Bible. Yeah, it's probably turned the other cheek. Okay. Psalm 5, 38 to 40. Here we go. You have heard, yeah, that's what it is. You have heard what it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Hmm. Well, you interpret scripture. The best interpreter of scripture is other scripture. And in 1 Timothy, it says that a man who does not take care of his family is worse than a pervert. Now, I know what it says about turn the other cheek. But if any buddy comes into my house and it's going to threaten my kids or grandkids or wife, um, I'm willing to take the chance of maybe breaking the God's law and, and maybe breaking some bones in defense of my family. Okay? 
Now, self-defense, I wouldn't be too quick, okay? But I am going to protect innocent people, and I see that in the Bible, okay? And if, if people have a problem with that, I understand turn the other cheek. I understand love your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you. I think that's the right thing to do. And I think as we've talked a lot tonight about yielding to God, and when you yield to God, I think that natural thing is there. There's many times I've had to forgive my enemies. I don't have any enemies, okay? Um, although, yeah, how do you forgive your enemies if you don't have any? <laughs> okay, there's many times I've had to forgive people that um, have wronged me or I thought they wronged me, okay? There's many times when people were hurting me and I didn't lift a finger to, um, to go against them. I think that teaching in Matthew 5 is more than just for physical harm. I mean, there was a lot of physical harm that went on there with the Romans abusing the Jews at the time, so they could relate to that immediately. But I think it, it, it means that, but it goes beyond that as well. Okay? Let the Lord defend you. He can defend you way stronger than you can. Now, as far as fathers and, you know, mothers and their children, you know, you have been there to, God put you there to defend. You know, you're the defense of the little ones. You're the defense of the, of the, of the helpless, you know? And I think we've got a biblical mandate to do that. Um, we're supposed to love. Um, greater love hath no man that he would lay down his life for his friends. So how is it going to lay down their life for his friends? Possibly in defense of his friends. Okay. You see how I'm using other scripture? To interpret other scripture and that's how you come to a whole understanding of the bible on a topic you make sure you're hitting all the scriptures that talk about it okay um you've got to take care of your family i think god expects that great question i've had good long discussions about that they've been very fruitful last question of the night i can see the clock and we're running out of time here we go who was Calvin? Who was Arminius? Well, here's a summary of the Wikipedia discussion of who these guys are. Okay? John Calvin, and I'm quoting from the Wikipedia page. And and you know what? I don't always trust Wikipedia, but I know enough of Calvin and I know enough of Arminius that they hit it right here. Okay, and they're accurate. John Calvin was a French theologian. Okay? I think his, his French name is pronounced Jean Chauvin, okay? Jean Chauvin, okay? Like chauvinist, you know, Jean Chauvin. John Calvin was a French theologian, pastor, and reformer in Geneva during the Protestant Reformation, so mid-1500s. He was a principal figure in the development of the system of Christian theology, later called Calvinism, including its doctrines of predestination, and God's absolute sovereignty in the salvation of the human soul from death and eternal damnation. That's John Calvin. Jacobus Arminius was a Dutch theologian during the Protestant Reformation period, same time, whose views became the basis of Ar Arminianism and the Dutch Remonstrant movement. He served from 1603 as professor of theology at the University of Leiden, and wrote many books and treaties on theology. So that's who they were. They were theologians in Europe, Holland and uh, and uh, um, Switzerland specifically. We're out of time. Bruce, expect to see you at Bible study. I expect we miss you. Come on now. You get that electric bike of yours, and man, we, we want to see you out. Miss you. Tomorrow night is our prayer meeting and Bible study at 315 Lisker at the Bible House. Everybody's welcome. Always a good time. Thursday night, even a better time because we have soup and we have fun. You know, it's supposed to be a high of 10 tomorrow here in Ottawa, plus 10. Now, it's supposed to be raining, but dear God, I can't read. I've been in Ottawa 24 years. I can't remember a more milder winter. Winter, It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Well, I can't skate in the canal. Oh, cry me a river. I'd rather take the warm weather. Sorry, I love it. I'm enjoying it, okay? And uh, so you're you're uh, welcome. And uh, uh, um, Sunday, of course, we're at uh, Peace Tower Church, 3 o'clock. I don't know what I'm preaching on yet, but 
you know what? All our messages, all our Ask the Pastor shows, they're all available on um, um, the Facebook page here, right here, and all the details of like when services are. And uh, our, our YouTube channel is growing. Okay, if you see that, copy the link and share it with your friends. Let's close a prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for everybody that's watching right now. Thank you for Kirk and the questions, Lord God. Thank you for the people sharing live on the comments tonight. Take everything that's been said and, 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 and that we've done, that, that's been said tonight, Lord God, and use it for your glory. God, what is of John counsel? Let it be like water off a duck's back. But Lord, what is of you? What is eternal, God? Let it stick to us like glue because it's going to give us life. It's going to protect us. It's going to empower us, Lord. And it's going to bless everybody that we come in contact with, God, if we let it have its way. And Lord, help us to let your word have its way in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Have a great night. Thanks for sharing it with us tonight.